Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Young Investors Podcast. This is episode 28, and joining me as always is Brandon. How's it going, Brandon? Hey, I'm going good. I'm a little bit tired this morning. I was up late last night. You know you know how I'm a pretty decent Star Wars fan? Yes, I do. Yeah, yes, you are. They've yeah. got this... Uh, yes, yes, I am. Yes, that is correct. They've got this <laughs> um, massive Star Wars convention that they hold like every couple of years over in the oh, States. Okay. Yeah. They do like heaps of panels and stuff. So they did a panel at two in the morning, our time. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Which I might have watched about episode nine. <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah. How long did that go for? Went for an hour and a half. But uh, Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. So they released a trailer and I've been watching that like a madman. Um, but yeah, any Star Wars fans out there, um, leave a like on this video. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm one of those strange people who've never... I, I've watched one Star Wars film. Oh, I, my gosh. I, I don't think there's many people out there who haven't watched at least a few of them. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm, I'm a rare species out here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, can't say I'm... Uh, can't say you, what you, you just said is one of your proudest <laughs> moments, but um, <laughs> that's all right. I'll, I'll, I'll just leave it for now. <laughs> what have you been up to? Oh, not a lot. Just uh, working a lot on the channel and... You know, working hard. Just the same thing that I say every single week. Yeah. <laughs> no, nothing <laughs> you know, really different. Just no. been working. <laughs> yeah. Just yeah. making this podcast that I don't really like doing. And <laughs> 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 just kidding. I love this podcast. It's yeah. actually probably the best part of my week, honestly, because it's so just like laid back. and we Yeah, can it's just, pretty chill. We can just talk. It's pretty fun. I think we're getting, we're getting much better at it now. It's yeah, very, absolutely. it's just like very free flowing now. It's, it's good fun. It's now, I just treat it as like a chat as I feel like I'm just like on the phone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Just talking exactly. to someone on the phone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're definitely going to be need to organize a few more, um, in-person ones. I'll have to come up yeah. to Canberra and we'll, we'll put yeah. something in there. Yep. I'll look at what, um, when spilt milk's on and then we'll get you up here at that time. We'll record a couple. Absolutely. Sounds good. Yeah. Anyway, we should get into this. <laughs> we should, we should stop rambling. Should yeah, we go through absolutely. the get through the indices first up? Do you want me to? I'll fly through the indices if you want. Go for it. Yeah. All right. Cool. Um, so this is over the last three weeks, I should add, because um, we didn't actually talk about um, the indices when we were talking to Jazpreet. Um, so this is including that week as well. So in America, we've got the Dow Jones up three and a half percent. We've got the Nasdaq up four and a half percent. S and P five hundred up three point nine percent. And then over here in Australia it's actually not looking too bad as well. We've got the all odds up two point two percent and the ASX two hundred up uh two percent as well. So mm. decent like decent gains um yeah. across Australia and America in the last three weeks. Yeah, definitely. It's interesting that the Dow's up actually because Boeing, which is one of the biggest components of the oh, Dow, right. um, has been down quite a lot. Yeah. Um because the the news for Boeing just sort of has continued to just get worse and worse. I mean, they're getting sued by shareholders as well as oh, um, a, a class action from the families of people who were on the flights. Far uh, out. They had to, can they got uh, some orders cancelled. I think there was a $5 billion order that was cancelled or something. Um, so there's, there's all kinds of bad oh. news coming out of Boeing at the moment. Wow. Yeah, that's crazy. But nothing else has like actually happened. Like there haven't been any more like incidents or anything. It's just the aftermath. Is that right? No. Yeah. Not as far as I know of. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, man. Poor Boeing. Like that's that's tough. Like what we were talking about that last podcast is a tough uh, tough industry to be in when obviously you're making things that fly in the sky and when things don't go right with the things that fly in the sky. <laughs> like yeah. that's the thing is that like how many I don't even know how many planes they would make um, in a year, but it only takes one of them to have just like even a minor fault and then that yeah. destroys your company's reputation like forevermore. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it can be devastating. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, yeah. So that's surprising. But I, I saw that you've got this kind of flows us into the next, the first news topic that, well, one of the news topics that I saw you had, with the all of the numbers being up so much, is that the S and P five hundred you've written is about to surpass its all time high. Yeah. Do you want to kind of talk through that a bit more? Because that's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So I just noticed this actually. Yeah. It's, it's been insane because I mean, uh, it's been about six months since the market was as high as it is right now. Yeah. So it sort of went down for three months and now it's sort of gone up for the past three months in this sort yeah. of V sort of style action. Yeah. And, it looks um, quite like just like a straight V went straight down, came pretty much straight back up. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it was kind of just like a, I think a lot of people around that time thought that that was going to be the start of a, yeah. a more significant downturn. Um, 
And uh, yeah, it, it ended right before Christmas, I think. I think I remember Christmas Day was like horrible. <laughs> right. And then uh, yep. the day after it just started to go back up and it sort of recovered. But something <laughs> I thought that was interesting was that a lot of the the biggest stocks, sort of just some of the big names, even just the FANG names, are still yep. quite a lot, like are quite a fair way down from the highs that they set in 2018. So right. just to give you a few of them, uh, Facebook is still down 18% from the high that it set in... I think it was around July yeah. of 2018. So it's been down for almost an, an entire year now. Jeez, uh, okay. Amazon is down 10% from its high. Google is still down 5% from its high. Uh, Apple is down 14% from its high. Yeah, so, that's, that's yeah. interesting. I, w- I can understand why Amazon is down that much because Amazon is just like, it was just one of those insanely high PE um, yep. stocks that like um, I'm not surprised that that came down but then again like the other ones were still high PE stocks so investors were expecting a lot but yeah uh, I, I wouldn't have expected especially things like yeah Facebook and Google and Apple to still be down um, Apple maybe because they've had some stuff going on Facebook maybe because they had well even like they had that Cambridge Analytica stuff but that seems to have just all blown over now and no, nobody's really talking about it anymore but um so it's yeah. a bit surprising they're still down by so much and Google as well, Google being the beast that it is. Yeah, I mean, I just remember looking at a lot of these businesses towards the end of 2017, so before 2018, and Google, Facebook, all of these stocks had PEs of above 30. Yeah. And now, like, Facebook's sitting at around 22, I believe. Google's right. at a 27. I mean, they've just come down a, a little bit. I mean, yeah. uh, it, it's not a huge amount, but... Obviously, they've continued to grow their earnings and their stock prices are either sort of flattening out or they're lowering. And uh, I guess hopefully we see this continue for a little bit longer Mm. uh, and see their stock prices go down a little bit more so that we can sort of buy them at a good valuation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess it's one of those things I just wish that... I just want the market to go down. <laughs> I just want some stocks to get cheaper because, like, there are some real good businesses. And, yeah, some of them are still down, but even when you, like, analyze them, they're still quite substantially too highly priced for the moment. But then again, the stock market is a slow, it's a long grind. So, you know, a couple of years in the stock market is nothing. So we'll have to see what the next couple of years has in store. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. Um, did you want to talk about this uh, this Ray Dalio um, thing that you chucked in here? Because I haven't heard about this. What what was this news story? Yeah, so Ray Dalio every now and then he goes on CNBC and he's he's one of the regular guests, sort of like Warren Buffett has he's his so interview. Good. Yeah, <laughs> he's Warren great. Buffett's the best. <laughs> Warren Buffett um, and Ray Dalio. I like well, both that, of them. Yeah, Ray Dalio is excellent. Yeah. Um, I I'm reading his book at the moment actually, Principles. Oh. Oh, okay. Um, nice. It's got not a lot to do with the stock market, but it's got a lot to do with sort of just ha- like how you can uh, take on feedback and just like sort of compound oh, right. your success. And it's a lot about how he was able to grow because he's he was the founder of Bridgewater, which is the most successful hedge fund in history. So right. it's the biggest hedge, fu- hedge fund that's ever been built. Uh, so he knows a little bit about <laughs> success. He might know, <laughs> he might know something, <laughs> might know a thing or two. Yeah, but anyway, he was on he was on CNBC and he was talking about sort of income inequality. So um, a little bit of a sidestep from uh, the stock market, and he yep. was just talking about the general U.S. Uh, basically the just capitalism and the U.S. economy. Right. Um, and he his basic basic idea is that uh, there's been a reduction in sort of public education spending, which and 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 other support systems for sort of lower class people that have in historically helped them to. Uh, grow their wealth and move into the the middle and upper class right. um, and he he believes that because there's been a reduction in these sort of uh, support systems uh, th- that it's contributed to a widening gap between the wealth of the rich and the poor because uh, that that's just a fact yeah. there's the uh, the top I think it's top 0.01 percent or something owns the same amount of wealth as the bottom 40 percent or something Cra- it, yeah. it's, it's, it's crazy it's a big gap. But that's interesting hypothesis. So he reckons that mainly it's the um, the gap or the the reduction in public education spending. 
Yeah, so he, he sort of argued that it's... He, he blames capitalism, really. Right. And I, th- that was the main... So the reason that this is interesting is because it was quite a heated discussion and you should look it up online if you, yeah, if you haven't seen I'll it before. Yeah. Um, but essentially, they were... There was one of the hosts, Joe Kernan, one of the CNBC hosts, yeah. was arguing basically that it's not capitalism's fault, but it's actually a bunch of other factors. So they were, I, I don't think they were particularly arguing about anything really they were just arguing about what's to blame and dalio yeah. blames capitalism and kernan was saying that it's it's not capitalism but i don't think that's i don't i mean i don't find that very interesting debating yeah. about a, a word or like the definition of yeah, a word yeah, yeah. um but yeah I, I think it is interesting to to talk about because as that gap widens what dalio has spoken about it uh, he talks about this in his books and in his other interviews is that there was one other time that this happened uh, significantly, and that was right after the Great Depression, uh, which was the other big debt sort of uh, crash like the one we experienced in 2008. So yep. um, the very, very similar things are happening. It's kind of like the same, a similar pattern is happening. And what happened was when there was the next recession, which was uh, 1937, uh, there was a lot of chaos and there was a lot of sort of social disruption because of this. And a lot of people were blaming the rich because for the recession and that sort of thing. So that, that's why he's talking about it because he thinks that it's going to, it could uh, become a lot worse if we don't fix the problem where we help sort of right. people at the bottom. At the bottom, yeah. Hmm, very interesting. Yeah, I'm going to have to look that one up because I have not seen it. I imagine it will have gathered a fair amount of views though. Yeah, you should be able to find it. It's a, it's quite an interesting interview. It goes for about 20 minutes. Oh, um, right, Okay. Yeah. I'll have to. I'll make. I'll make sure I read it after. Uh, listen to it after. Um, all right. So, next story. Oh, this is interesting. I think this happened this week. I don't know because I don't pay much attention to politics. <laughs> the Australian election has been called for um, the 18th of May. Woo. That's not too far away. Yeah. And I found this interesting. It could produce Australia's seventh leader in just over one decade. <laughs> How ridiculous! How just that's just so stupid. It is far out. It's just and it ridiculous. causes not like I feel like there's been no major change in Australia over the last decade. There's just been too much swapping around, you know, chopping and changing, and there's just been no- nothing like nothing. I even I use the example of like the NBN, like back when the NBN was first announced mm. and was going to be introduced. If they had just built the damn thing start to finish and got it done, it would have been great. Like, it would have been a good system if they'd just done it. Because at the time, yeah. it was good technology. The fact that it's dragged out for so long and it's been flipped over because we've had, you know, liberal labor, liberal labor and all that sort of stuff. And um, and now, where we are now, the MBN is, like, still not finished and private companies are now building the 5G network, which is producing mm. mobile speeds, which are 30 times faster <laughs> than the NBN. So it's like... We've invested so much money in this system. There's been so much umming and ahhing that we didn't ever get it done. And now it's already like obsolete. It's like, what the hell? Can we just get a solid leader? And can we just stick with them for a little while so we can get some stuff done? (laughs) (laughs) No, you're exactly right. Like, there's just not enough. I mean, seven in one decade. If we have seven in one decade, what is that? It's like one every 1.2 years or something. Yeah. Like, what are you supposed to get done in that time? Yeah, I reckon. It's like, Like, I don't even reckon I can name them all. Like, I can't even remember. It's like (laughs) Julia Gillard and Kevin Rudd. Howard. uh, Howard. Abbott. Abbott and ScoMo. Yeah. Is there anyone else? There must be. Seventh leader. So So, there must be one more. Am I just, like, forgetting... Probably. Probably. Know. Oh, gosh. Oh, um, the last guy before uh, ScoMo. <laughs> Turnbull. Oh, bloody flippin' turn- Turnbull. That's right. <laughs> See, that just shows you how much we care about politics. He- he's only moly. been gone for a couple months. I've already forgotten about him. Well, that's, yeah, that's it. It's just like, well, I'm, I'm getting ready to forget ScoMo. Like, who's coming in next? I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. After that, anyway, it's ridiculous. Anyway, I chucked this in. I was gonna ask you if there's anything, any issues that you particularly care about that you wanted to be, that you hope are kind of the center of attention in the lead up to or during the campaigns and in the lead up to the election. Because me personally, like I care about a fair few like social issues, but the one that stands out to me is climate change. I really hope that that becomes a really big um, issue and a really big um, discussion point 
um, leading up to the election, but uh, I don't know, neither of the parties seem to be particularly focused on <laughs> helping us out and solving climate change. But anyway, is there any issues that you hope kind of come up? Yeah, I agree. I think climate change should be um, one of the major topics. I don't think it will be, unfortunately. Nah. I think a major one that I'm interested in about as well is uh, the negative gearing um, right. and so the, the changes to the the tax laws that labor want to do which is they want to ha- they want to take away 25% of the discount on capital gains so you mm. pay capital gains on 75% of assets um, held over yep. 12 months rather than on 50% yep. and that new properties wouldn't be able to be negatively geared right. meaning the rent can't be below uh, it, what is it the rent can't be below uh, so you can't have the rent below the the uh, ta- the the uh, interest payments and then take a tax deduction on that oh okay um, right which is something that you could do at the moment but and they want to get uh, they want to get um What's the other thing they want to do? Oh, that's right. Didn't, do they still want to get rid of the fully frank dividend system? They do, yeah. That's, that's yeah. the other one, yeah. That's crazy. That's I feel like that's... Um, well, that doesn't really affect me too much because I don't really look at dividends all that much. I mean, for the passive investing, it does. But um, yeah, I, I feel like that's not the right way to go about things. But anyway, that's just my opinion. Anyway. Yeah. Um, but yeah, interesting. So so they want to tighten up the um, the kind of rules around negatively gearing properties. I've never quite like truly understood negative gearing because in like I get that it's a tax thing and that sort of stuff, but it just makes sense to me that y- you you would rather positively gear a property. But yeah, um, you, yeah, it, it's just about the tax deduction. Like if you yeah. run a business and you're running it at a loss, you can use those losses to offset your tax, uh, and yeah. it, then. At the moment, it's the same with a property. If you're running a property at a loss, you can use the losses to offset your tax. Um, and but if I you mean, get, yeah. The thing that I don't get is that generally, like, obviously with income tax, if you're paying more tax, it means you're earning more money. But um, I don't know. I I don't think either of us know enough about this to have a meaningful conversation about it. Yeah, we'll so, leave it to let, the politicians and yeah, see what happens. See what <laughs> happens. Uh, Australian election, 18th of May. See what happens. Um, last news story. New details surrounding uh, Disney's streaming service, Disney Plus. That's actually mm. they they announced. I think it's coming out in uh, November. Oh, okay. Um, of this year, so that's pretty epic. But they had a, I think they had some sort of um, shareholder something or other over the last couple of days, and um, there's been some new details. So the, this is kind of linking back in how we talk about Netflix a fair while and all the competition coming out with Netflix. So. Disney Plus now, this is their lineup, right? All the original Star Wars movies. They've got a Loki series, so Marvel. They've got a Winter Soldier series, Marvel. They've got the Marvel new Marvel movies will be on there. They've got The Mandalorian, which is a live-action Star Wars TV show. They've got a Cassian Andor Star Wars TV show. They've got a Monsters, Inc. TV show. They've got High School Musical TV show. They've got all the Pixar movies. They've got National Geographic. They've got... They just announced, actually, that The Simpsons is going to be um, all on there as, like, as soon as they release the streaming service. And they've also got... Um, a Lady in the Tramp movie or something like that coming out. So the the amount of content, the amount... You know how we're talking about Netflix and how it's like the battle of the original content because yeah. they really have to up their game because they're losing those licensed properties because they're going back to the original content holders. It's just, yeah, Disney Plus is just looking so, so strong in terms of original content. Um, and their pricing too. Their pricing is quite good as well. The pricing is insane for what you get. Six, seven dollars a month, or seventy dollars for a year if you pay up front. I mean, that's the amount. That this is the problem that I've had with Netflix is that it's a great idea and it's been a fantastic service. But there's just these behemoth businesses out there that have so much original content yeah. that it really. I'm sure it didn't cost Disney that much money to set this up. Whereas Netflix is piling billions and billions of debt that they've taken on. Into, uh, into making these movies because Netflix wasn't a movie studio before, what, like 2000, 1995, maybe? Yeah, but I don't even know, yeah. Disney's been doing this for 100 years. Yeah, it's been a long time. <laughs> and they have a lot, a of, lot content. of content. And uh, I think it'll be a, a, a no-brainer for a lot of people. I mean, if you're a parent and, you know, you, you want to, you need something for your kids, then this is just an absolute no-brainer. And the amount of content that's on there, not just for kids, but for, you know, The Simpsons is on there, National Geographic, yeah. uh, like all the Star Wars, Marvel yeah, movies. Marvel. Yeah, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, 
the interesting thing as well, I was uh, I did a video on Netflix recently, so I was reading through some of the annual reports, and the management team in the annual reports saying uh, are saying that their focus over the next few years, like even in the years to come, is going to be so heavily on original content. They're so heavy focused on original content that they think that they're going to continue to have multiple years into the future of significant negative free cash flow just to fund their um, production of original content to try and keep up. So I think that that's a, a pretty obvious way of, of Netflix saying, look, we we need to pull these massive, massive moves to try and keep up with the competition. Because I was actually looking at Amazon Prime. There's mm. more than a hunt now. There's more than a hundred million subscribers to Amazon Prime. Oh, wow. And they, really? they all have, uh, yeah. And that's actually, that's just in the US. So they don't, they don't talk about the total number. I think they keep that number close to their chest. But they did say that they have more than 100 million at the, at the end of last year, in December of last year. And Netflix has only got 140 million worldwide subscribers. So, like, it's obviously a big gap, but um, it could close quite substantially. And especially with Disney coming in, I'd be really interested to see if Disney starts reporting the subscription numbers on uh, Disney Plus once it gets up and running. That'll be super interesting to see the competitive landscape of the streaming service space. But, yeah. Um, yeah. I, think we'll I just mean, have to wait and see. Yeah, exactly. And I'll, I'll be interested to see if this has any effect on Netflix's growth because if, if I mean, people might just go out and buy Disney on top of their Netflix subscription, yeah, but true. I'm interested to see if people switch. And if they switch, then that's going to significantly hurt Netflix because, as you said, they're already anticipating uh, heavy negative cash flow. And if they're not bringing, bringing in as much revenue anymore, then their cash flows are going to be even more negative. And at some point, that debt has to be paid you're yeah. if you're taking on debt you're borrowing from your future self so at some point netflix yeah. has got to put that back <laughs> and if they can never get profitable they're not going to be able to put it back and yeah, that's that that's the my biggest worry with netflix netflix and was I, down five percent on this news by the way yeah yeah um wow okay pretty substantial um yeah i think when i was reading through i believe they don't have any major debt payments due for a few years yeah um so it i think like and their current ratio is like okay so i think they've got um a few years to try and figure this out so it's going to be i think it's going to be like a story that will kind of come come through in like the next maybe three or four years but i don't know we'll have to just keep watching i guess anyway that's kind of the news um we've got a yeah fair few news stories should we jump into um the second section of the podcast yeah yeah so in the second section of the podcast we're just going to be going through a bunch of your questions um, that uh, Brandon thankfully collected for us because we didn't have a topic this week. No, uh, but uh, you, you collected these a couple of weeks ago, right? Yeah, and, uh, yeah well, I just wanted to um, obviously give you guys an opportunity to to give your feedback and to you know say what you wanted us to talk about. So we've gathered a whole bunch of different topics that were submitted, um, not even just questions. Sometimes they are just like topics and we're just going to discuss kind of our thoughts on the different topics. So, um, I th the first one which uh, caught my attention was mm. a question uh, which comes back to kind of the formula that we both kind of use uh, from Phil Town's books. And he says, um, this, this person writes in saying, Phil Town looks at 10 years worth of numbers to work out his sticker price or like the fair value of the company um, before margin of safety. What do you guys, uh, oh, sorry, why do you guys use only a five-year formula? Um I can answer this one first, I guess. Go for it. A lot, the reason that I u tend to use five years as opposed to 10 is because the areas that fit in my circle of competence are far, kind of fast changing uh, sectors and fast changing industries. So obviously being like a 24 year old um, guy in Australia, like I like things like tech, um, internet based kind of uh, companies and that sort of thing. So uh, in, in this area, things change very quickly. So I think you've got to recognize that. You've got to recognize that um, obviously the potential to make a company on the internet is, is almost unlimited. So things can change very quickly. Um, so you've got to just factor that in. So looking 10 years out into the future is probably a, a little bit risky in some of these areas. So uh, sometimes I just like to estimate kind of five years into the future and... Um, and then work backwards from there. 
because uh, I, I just couldn't I couldn't say with confidence that I think this company will be worth this much in 10 years um, when the, even the internet itself and, and how we use the internet has changed like a ridiculous mm. amount in the last 10 years. Uh, what do you reckon? Yeah, yeah. I, if I'm looking at anything that's tech-related, that's in a fast-changing industry, I'm usually looking five years out for that reason that you just explained. Yep. Um, however, I actually look 10 years out most of the time. Yep. Um, when I'm looking at, say, like a cyclical business, you even have to look sometimes 15 years out because you need to look at the entire cycle. And considering this economic cycle has gone for so long this time, it's gone from 2000 and the peak was around 2007, 2006. And now we're peaking at around uh, 2019. That's such a long cycle. You need to look at that entire cycle to work out what are the cash flows going to be. Because at the start of the cycle, the cash flows are usually very low if we're in a recession. And then they build up over time and they become excessively high around this time. And the same for defensive stocks. I usually look 10 years out because with defensive stocks, they're usually in, in industries that are not changing that much. So you can look 10 years out. Uh, and you, if their earnings are fairly stable, slow growth, maybe between like three and eight percent, then you can be pretty confident if you understand the business that over the next 10 years, they can continue to chug along at three to eight percent growth. Yeah, um, I think it's worth clarifying that, um, especially with those, what, what I was just talking about, even though some of these industries are fast changing and I only look, I only like value five years maybe into the future and work backwards from there. Um, I, I still, like when I approach investing, I still have a 10 year plus um, investing horizon. Mm. So like ideally, I, I would like to be holding these companies. Well, I want to be like Warren Buffett. I want to be able to hold these companies literally and, until I die probably. Um, like I don't want to have to sell my stocks if I don't have to. So um, even though I only value them maybe in, in the shorter term because it's a fast changing uh, industry or sector, I still make sure that I'm investing for the, you know, 10, 10 year plus mindset mm. kind of thing. Yeah. 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 I mean, if they're a riskier stock, if they're in a changing industry, like a Facebook or an Adobe or something like that, then it just means that we'll, when we're calculating the cash flows, we want to do it in a shorter period because we want to know that we're going to get our money back quicker because yeah. because there's more uncertainty beyond the five year horizon. It doesn't mean that we don't believe in the company long term. Yeah. There's just a little bit more uncertainty. Yeah. No, I'd agree with that. Um, all right. That's uh, that's a good way to wrap up that question. Um, this is one that's kind of more directed at me, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, why don't you talk about the shares you are monitoring and why? Um, so I recently stopped doing my Stocks I'm Watching series and I've changed it to a Stock Analysis mm. series. Um, that was off of... I, did, I made a video about this. That was off of a recommendation that we got from a financial services lawyer yes. um, who was just talking about um, make, make, d- just delivering our content in a slightly different way. So we, we shouldn't be delivering our content that implies that we have a certain opinion about a stock. So um, that's why we've kind of changed that. I don't really talk about the shares that I own anymore and partly that's just because like it just caused so much like so much not even debate but just like constant arguing and like some people say oh that's great and other people say oh you you know you're terrible this is a shocking company and that sort of stuff and you just after a while you just get sick of the negativity so I'd much rather now just break down a company for what it is and try and keep it quite objective and less opinionated um and uh, and then kind of go from there as opposed to saying hey look I'm adding this one to my portfolio and plus I, I don't wanna I, I was having a bit of an issue I don't know if you've run into this issue as well Hamish um, you, mm. I'd still get comments where people would be like oh you know I bought this stock because of you and yeah. they at the time like they would say it in like a positive light like oh thank you so much for letting me know I just wanted to let you know that I bought this stock because of you I'm so excited and that sort of stuff but it's just like I just hate I hate that. I hate that people buy a stock because of me. Um, especially because, like, obviously I'm completely different to you who's completely different to the next person down the road, the next investor. So it's like, if there's a company that I'm looking at and I buy in, then if their stock price maybe goes down in the short term, I don't care. But for some people, if they buy a stock and maybe they're not in a great financial position, the stock goes down... Maybe it's financially crippling for them, and then they get super angry, and it's like, oh my gosh. So, yeah, I don't know. What What are you What are your thoughts on this? 
Yeah, well, I, I mean, I stopped doing the stocks on buying series a long time ago, just not even yeah. because of what we went to the lawyer and um, he said that it was probably a good idea to move away from that, but not even because of that. It was just because I was so sick of seeing every YouTuber make those videos like three times a week. Yeah, um, yeah. And it's a bit I was, of saturation, isn't it? Yeah. It was. It became a series that just sort of everyone, like from a creator's standpoint, knew that they were going to do well in terms yeah. of views. So it was kind of like an easy way to just milk some views and yeah. um, get the AdSense churning. So true, so true um, actually. Yeah. So I, I stopped doing that a while ago just because I don't think, um, I don't think it's that helpful for people because yeah. I, like you say, I think there's that there's a group of people out there who who they, they go to those videos to find stocks to just buy based yeah. on people's opinions. And I think that is the wrong way. I think I'd much rather talk about how you can invest yourself and yeah. use examples um, maybe to show you how things work. But yeah. I don't want anyone to just buy a stock because someone else says it. I don't yeah. do it. No one recommends that you do that if they're a successful investor. It's yeah, it's totally... Like, that is the last thing that we want to do. The last thing we want to do is make content that tries to push you in a particular direction or well, not, yeah. not a particular direction, but towards a particular decision yes. um, surrounding a particular stock. Like, because obviously, we you've heard us talk about our strategy. Like, our number one, well, the first thing we always talk about is circle of competence and understanding the business. And you can't understand a business from a 10-minute video where, you know, this YouTuber is just talking this stock up. So that's why particularly I've tried to change this series into something that's just like, it's not like stocks that I'm watching now. It's just, let's pick this company because it might be just an interesting company to look at. Let's look at it really objectively and let's talk about positives and negatives of it so that it's more of like an informative process as opposed to, I like this company and I am buying this company. Do do what you will. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, for me, there's sort of two directions that a YouTuber can go. One is the direction where you just do whatever you can to please the audience and yep. you'll get a lot of views, you'll grow really quickly and you'll be really successful. And I think some people have gone down that road. Yep. For me personally, I honestly don't even care that much about growing my channel massively. I'd rather help the small amount of people and actually and actually help them. Yeah. Um, so I, I a while back I just had to think. I was like, I, this can go one of two ways. <laughs> I can go the way where I'm just gonna try and find out how to make this algorithm work as best as I can for me, and just give the videos that are gonna do really well, even if they're not helpful. Or yep. I can just do what I'm passionate about, which is actually helping people make sort of rational decisions about investments. And the thing that I find interesting is that in the long term. Um, the people that go down that route of just wanting to get clicks and getting views, especially in this investing space, like, oh my God, this company is the best, <laughs> that, that kind of stuff. They they lose into like that, just they lose their reputation. That yeah. reputation just gets completely eroded. So even though it might not be the, the best, you know, the, the most um, watched thing in the world, um, maybe talking about this is, you know, this is how you invest as opposed to this is the stock you should buy. Um, it keeps people, um, well, it keeps your reputation up and it shows to people that you actually do care about um, them getting better at investing as opposed to your bank account going up <laughs> yeah. because you're getting more AdSense revenue. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I think we've spoken enough about this topic. <laughs> yeah. Should we move on to the next one? So the yeah, next one, sure. not really a question, just a topic that we can discuss. Uh, yeah. And this person wanted to know what are our thoughts on gold. Mm. So what are your what are your thoughts on gold, Brandon? Um, I got nothing against gold, and I kind like I I class gold is well, it's just it's in the class of a non productive asset. Um, so it's more or less you're buying the thing in the hope that you can sell it for more one day, but in the yeah. meantime, it doesn't do anything for you. So for instance, another, another thing that falls into this category is Bitcoin. Um, so Bitcoin, mm. you buy it with the hope that one day it will be worth more and you can sell it. But in the meantime, it doesn't actually do anything. Um, whereas when you look at a business, sure, you buy the shares and you hope that one day you'll be able to sell them for more, but at the same time, behind what that behind that price that you bought them at is a business it's it's essentially a business is a cash producing machine it's mm. essentially a money printing machine and the way 
And the interesting thing is that successful businesses are all just money printing machines, but the way that they print their money is different. Like some of them sell smartphones, some of them sell editing software, some of them, you know, sell power, electricity. Your data. Yeah. <laughs> Facebook. Yeah, some no, of them sell, yeah, some of them sell your privacy. <laughs> um, but... Uh, I just find it interesting. So obviously there's a business behind that that generates cash, like it generates a cash flow. Because it generates a cash flow, you can kind of, uh, especially if it's a steady cash flow, you know, with a competitive advantage and a good management, a good management team, you can better understand what that cash flow is actually worth. Um, whereas you can't really, like a lump of gold is worth whatever someone's willing to pay for it. It mm. could be worth a million dollars. It could be worth one cent. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my thoughts on gold. Like I've got nothing against it and sure lots of people like to invest in gold and sure it, it seems to hold up all right when there's a massive recession. But for me, like just my way of approaching things, I want to buy cash producing assets. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in the same boat. I've probably got two opinions on this. The first is that uh, like, same as you, I look for businesses, I look for assets that produce cash flow. Uh, and the reason that I need assets that produce cash flow is because I value assets on how much cash I'm going to get out of them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I want to know that if I'm putting $100 into this asset, I want to know that I'm going to get back more than $100. And with gold, you there's not really a way of doing that in terms of the cash flow that it produces because it doesn't produce any cash flow. Uh, yeah. You have to sell it in order to make money. Uh, the other side is that I just don't understand it. it I, I'm entirely open to the possibility that there is another way to value gold based on the supply and demand of it in the world yeah. or some other factor that I just don't know. But I just don't really have any interest or I don't really care about it and yeah, I, mean, I don't yeah. understand it. So that's the other reason I wouldn't touch gold because I, I don't know how to calculate its value. Yeah. No, I, I'm with you 100% there. Um, yeah, I think we've said it all pretty yep. much there. I mean, a lot of people have differing opinions to us, but um, yeah, I guess that's uh, that's the beauty of opinions. <laughs> yeah. That's just what we think. All right, Everyone's next got question. one. <laughs> yeah, everyone's got one. Sometimes you want to hear them, sometimes you don't. <laughs> all right, next question. Um, I work a job that I don't really like. Oh, this is interesting. This is more like a, a personally finance entrepreneurship motivation one. Um, yeah. Should I focus on a side hustle? Is it mm. worth it? And what side hustles do you think are worth it? Yeah. Um, what do you reckon? Yeah. So, okay. In terms of side hustles, I think a lot of people would be a lot happier if they found themselves a side hustle that were that they were passionate about. Yeah. Because I think a lot of people just sort of, they, they go down the career path and it's just not for them. For a lot of people, it is for them. Um, yeah. They'll find themselves a career that they're really satisfied with, and they just want to they just want to work the traditional that sort of way. Um, but for a certain certain subsection of people, that's just not gonna cut it. And uh, I, I think for me personally, it's a lot more satisfying to get up every day and just sort of build work build on something that I've created. Yeah, like it's it's in almost entirely me. Obviously, I rely on other people. Yeah. Um, but and and other platforms and that sort of thing, but. It's entirely up to me to build it. Um, yeah, for sure. And I mean, in terms of finding one, uh, I, I think there's... I'll tell you the way that I went about it. So, I think that you should just find something you're really passionate about, like a hobby or something you do that you really enjoy, and then learn how to monetize it. I think... Yeah. Yeah. The, the One of the problems I had when I was starting out was that I started by looking for ways to make money and they just failed because... I wasn't passionate about them. Yeah, I your heart's I, not in it. Yeah, I started to look for things that could make money, like starting some kind of drop sh shipping store. Um, and my heart wasn't in it, so you just don't put the effort in and it, it doesn't work. But if you start with the passion and then you just work out how to monetize it, because you can pretty much monetize any passion, I think, out there. Yeah, pretty there's, much. Yeah. There's always someone doing what you want to do and making money doing it. So just find those people yeah. and just copy what they're doing. Because passion, yeah, because passion, I was just butting, passion leads to expertise because um, yes, you become yeah. an expert in the things that you really care about because you spend your time learning more about the things you care about um, even when you don't have to because yes, you enjoy yeah. doing it. And when passion leads to expertise, expertise can be very easily monetized because there are other people out there that want the expertise that you've built by learning about something that you're passionate about. Mm. So you can apply that to literally anything. 
Um, if you've got expertise because you're passionate about something, then that can easily translate into money. You've just got to think about the way in which to do that. Sorry, I did cut you off there. No, no, that, that's completely it. I mean, like, if I give you an example, if you're into guitar, you there's so many different things you could do. You could entertain other people by playing guitar. You could teach yep. other people how to play guitar. Or you could even just sell products, physical products that are related to yep. musical instruments. I mean, yep. there's there's all these different paths you can take. And you just have to find your path, like, figure out what it is that you spend your time doing when you when you, you know, put you put your work down and you just want to relax and you just want to chill out and you find what you do in your spare time. And yep. there's many different ways that you can go about monetizing that. I, I agree pretty much in like, well, definitely entirely with what you say. Um, the only thing that I tend to see or that I tend, tend to see other people talking about is that when they work a job that they don't really like and then they start this side hustle, they tend to just... Um, they either just try try their side hustle for a bit and then it doesn't work as well as what they want initially and they give up and they go back to the job they don't like mm. or they tend to um, just quit the job that they don't like and start a side hustle from scratch, mm. which is a, a, a big effort because obviously something that you build yourself, like if you're starting something new, you've got zero followers, you've got zero um, customers, you're starting from scratch. So... The way that I always talk to people about it is if, you, if you're if you in a job that you don't like, keep going with your job because obviously you've got to think about your financial security here as well. Yeah. <laughs> keep going with keep going with your job, but th- just be motivated. I mean, and this will, this will test whether you're motivated enough to pursue what you want to do. In the hours that you don't work, like there's people have got a good like six hours a day where they're not at work. In those hours per day that you're not at work, spend some hours on your side hustle and try different things and be creative and be yourself and that sort of stuff and keep building on it. You know, don't waste your time. If you really want to, if you really want to escape this job and you really want to build a side hustle, then don't waste your time. Stop, you know, watching Netflix the whole time. Stop just scrolling Instagram for hours on end. Yeah. Spend some hours and then it'll probably start to build. And in that case, that that's when you've got to look at Um, Because obviously when you do your own thing, obviously the growth potential is so much higher. And when you just work for someone else, the growth potential, like your salary growth rate, I think the average salary growth rate is like 3% per year um, in Australia. So, yeah. yeah, So eventually there's going to be a a point where the stuff that you're doing yourself is going to take over. Mm. If you, you know, if you keep working on it, it's going to take over what you do at your job um, in terms of money, just in terms of everything. So... That's the way I would approach it is you don't don't just like quit your job and then start something from scratch. Still stay in your job and then start to chip away at your side hustle and start to build that and then make a decision when the time is right where you feel like the paths are ready to cross, where you can start to wind down the thing that you don't like doing and then start to take over the thing that you really do like doing. Yeah. And just yeah. start. Uh, it doesn't matter how little time you think you have. <clears throat> you always have more time, but it's obviously if you're going from doing nothing productive after work to you're not going to just go into coming home from work and working six hours a day That's on true. it like yeah. just just start doing something do half an hour a day just or like away. an hour a week yeah. and you slowly become more and more productive and you you'll be surprised by how much it compounds yeah like how, how more efficient you get in the couple of hours that you're spending every yeah. week or every day and by how how much less sort of unproductive things you want to do so like instead of spending half an hour on it and then wanting to just go and watch Netflix for four hours, yeah. you you actually feel like you want to do your side hustle for longer. And it, yeah. it's just this slow progress, progression over time. And um, it uh, for me, it's been, ex- it's been an incredible experience from when I've started doing it until now. Um, yeah. And it's definitely worth it. I wouldn't go back and change. The only thing I would go back and change is that I would work harder on it. <laughs> yeah, uh, harder on it sooner. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that's the thing, like that's the other thing I'd, Pick, uh, just bring up in, in this topic is people that say I don't have time <laughs> it's like Liars. you do have time <laughs> yeah you are a liar I mean <laughs> the it, classic this is a great example I'm going to pick on myself I woke up at 2 o'clock in the morning this morning to watch a one and a half hour flipping uh, panel <laughs> at Star Wars Celebration that's happening over in America if I can do that <laughs> I mean that was all leisure if I can do that then I can make the time to work a little bit harder on a side hustle. 
yeah. <laughs> everyone's got the time. I think people are just uh, just not committed enough. They sometimes they get a bit lazy. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway, exactly. Do that. do what you want to do and turn it into side hustle. Be smart with it financially and work hard on it. And before you know it, your side hustle will probably be your main thing. <laughs> yeah, hey, here's much. here's the next topic that I wanted to talk to you about, uh, which has been popping up heaps at the moment. Um, Lyft IPO and also uh, Uber is going to go public as well. Oh. So two big ride sharing um, um, companies are going to be public, which I found interesting. And Lyft is has actually now had its IPO and I'm trying to look up the stock price. Um, it's very interesting because it started high at $78 per share and immediately started falling to $70. Uh, yeah, so 78 down to 70 and then it bounced back up to 74 and now it's sitting at about 60. So it's had a rough ride. And I thought that this was interesting because this kind of highlights why, you know, why I don't invest in IPOs. And sure, you know, it's, it's very exciting. And I think that ride sharing and all that sort of stuff is very exciting, you know, future business and that sort of stuff, especially with Tesla and, all, and self-driving and that sort of stuff. But for me, I don't feel confident in buying a business that doesn't have heaps of financial records open to us immediately. Yeah. I just feel when I, when I look at IPOs and look at the price that they're IPOing at, I'm just like, man, this is just too much speculation for me. Like, I, I just don't feel confident in trying to value um, an IPO. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. I mean, there's basically four things we look at. Do you understand it? Economic moat, management, can you value it? The, it? It violates the first rule straight away, for most people at least. Like, you, you if you don't have financial records to look at, if you don't have a history of management saying they're, they're going to do things and then committing to those things over and over again for decades, then you probably aren't going to be able to develop an understanding of the business. Now, there's obviously a small percentage of people who might be very close in the industry that would have more knowledge about these kinds of businesses, but it, it still is true. Like You're probably not going to be, de- be able to develop a complete understanding of it and because of that, and it probably violates the economic moat as well, yep. just because it's something that's so new. You don't know if it's... Can't it, really it, it, it has, it. Yeah, it has no history of pushing off competition and, and sort of um, being successful for a really long period of time. Yeah. Um, yeah, go on. Uh, I was just going to say, with, with our investing strategy as well, I mean, all of those four key areas boil back down to trying to satisfy Warren, Warren Buffett's number one rule, which is don't lose money. Yeah, yeah, and if there's two, if there's a lot of uncertainty because you can't fill those four key areas, then um, then you don't, you, you're not certain. You know, how how can you be certain that you won't lose money? And like exactly what's happened in Lyft's case, Lyft started out at seventy, what was it, seventy eight dollars, seventy nine dollars per share, mm. and um, and you know it it's fallen, it's fallen down to now sixty dollars. So it's just it's very uncertain you you just can't judge it you just can't be sure that you won't lose money which violates Warren Buffett's number one rule yeah and another thing to mention is um, I I got this one from Warren Buffett in his book because he talks a lot about sort of just him as a business owner um, which is quite interesting because you get a perspective from that view rather than just from the view of him as a a stock picker but he talks about why companies go public and of course they go public because they need capital or they want capital but they always go public or most of the time they go public when they know that they can sell you a dollar for two because (laughs) then they're not going they're not going to sell shares of their business the the owner isn't going to sell share his own shares yeah. for 50 cents if they're worth a dollar he's only going to sell them if he can get a premium yeah, on those shares it's a capital shares. raising exercise yeah so they're trying to pick the time that will be most efficient to raise capital yeah and of course the the most IPOs happen right before there's a recession because everyone is so hyped about stocks there's money piling into the market like there has been for the past few years yep and people are really hyped about businesses like Lyft and Uber at the moment because they're really exciting, they're futuristic, and most of the time that means that these companies go public at a price that is a huge premium, meaning you, yeah. you're paying for future earnings that might not even happen. I mean, Lyft's uh, market cap at the moment is about $17 billion. 
they produced two billion in revenue, but they're not profitable. And Uber, Uber actually said that for the foreseeable future, they don't see them being prof- profitable. Oh, really? <laughs> so um, that's an amazing thing for a management to say, isn't it? That yeah. <laughs> for the foreseeable future, they're not going to be profitable. For the foreseeable future, you as an owner will be losing money. <laughs> it's like the Netflix example. For the foreseeable future, we are going to have seriously negative free cash flow every single year. <laughs> We're going to take money out of your pocket every year for the next forever. Yeah, like as far as we years. can see into the future. It's, 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 it's pretty funny, isn't it? It's just a completely different kind of in, like investment in quotation speculation slash yeah. speculation but yeah. it's just nothing that we would go anywhere near because we're looking for cash flow we're looking to make money yeah, we're not looking much. to speculate on some future possibility that's beyond f- the foreseeable future apparently for uber um yeah. that there may be some cash flow there yeah overall i think lyft and uber and like even like tesla with their ride sharing service when they come out with that very yeah. interesting space. Like, I'm, I'm totally interested in it. And especially with, like, I think Uber was planning on doing, like, um, autonomous drones to take people from A to B and that sort of stuff. Yeah. Like, holy... Like, the, the amount of, like, ideas uh, surrounding ride sharing and transportation at the moment, even Elon Musk and Boring Company and that sort of stuff and tunneling. Uh, so many really cool ideas, really interesting to research into. But in terms of uh, investment... Yeah, um, especially with these IPOs, it's uh, it's just too much uncertainty for myself. Um, yeah. And with that said, let's talk about let's get through maybe a couple more topics here, yeah. and then wrap it up because I think we're all almost at fifty minutes already. Um, the next topic I want to talk to you about is this: this viewer wanted just uh, us to talk about building wealth um, and minimalism. Specifically, they're talking about building wealth slowly and minimalism. So it's kind of two, I guess, key areas that kind of unlock um, long-term financial success, both of these. So, I I agree Mm. with both of these. And I actually think like building wealth, I I think that building, the the process of building wealth can only be done slowly. I think you can get rich quickly, but I think you can only build wealth slowly. So, I I see a lot like you you hear like people that win the lottery or maybe they've got a spec stock that just 10x itself. I don't think that is building wealth. Sure, you might earn a lot of money. Sure, you might get rich out of that. Um, but I think building wealth is something that can only be um, evaluated after a certain period of time, uh, because wealth is more the characteristic of, uh, of of being, you know, long-term, you know, financially free, yeah. being able to support your family and generational wealth and that sort of thing. And uh, so I think that building, like, and, and Warren Buffett always says he's ha- he's never had any interest in getting rich quickly. He always knew that he would get very rich, like he never doubted that for a second but he never thought that he would do it very quickly. And you look at how his net, um, net worth has accumulated over time. I mean, he's, he's earned, was it more than 50% of what he's, what is it? No, it's more than that. I can't remember the stat, but it's some like crazy percentage of what he's worth mm. has been gained only after his, his uh, 50th birthday. Yeah. So, yeah. and he's been investing since he was a kid. So <laughs> it's like, He's the king of slow wealth building. Exactly. But I mean, he is the world's best investor. He's worth so much money. It shows you that if you do take this approach, you will get rich. Like you will have a lot of money, but it's a process. It's all about that compounding and compounding in the first 10 years, compound interest doesn't look that great in the first 10 years. It's kind of like, oh, you know, uh, maybe, maybe I won't even bother. But then you leave it for 20 years, then you leave it for 30 years, and then 40, 50. And then when you start getting into the 50-year mark, you are earning like serious money every single year just because you've had that time of compounding. And I think that minimalism... I'll I'll let you talk in a second, Hamish. (laughs) Um, But uh, minimalism (laughs) is a big part of building wealth because it's kind of like a way that you live. So I think obviously people that are very materialistic, they have a very low probability of getting wealthy because they start, they run into money and they start spending it on shit that they don't need. Yeah. Um, minimalism, and you see all of like the finance YouTubers and even people like people that are really rich, like Warren Buffett and even people like Phil Town. I mean, he just lives on a ranch and he doesn't live in some like epic mansion in the city or some penthouse apartment or something like that. And he just has his ranch and he has horses and that sort of stuff. Warren Buffett still drives like a pretty ordinary kind of car he could buy any car that he wants but he doesn't and those guys are just perfectly happy with their wealth and they're perfectly happy with you know living minimal what do you reckon about this kind of issue 
Yeah. Yeah. In terms of minimal, minimalism, um, I mean, I just hate having a lot of stuff. Like it, it's pretty annoying. It, hey? it, it starts to just weigh on your mind, just having a lot of things going on in terms of like doing a lot of th- different things in terms of maybe yeah. your work or your business, but also just having a lot of, just buying a lot of things. It just, all of that stuff gives me a headache. Like every, yeah. <laughs> every few weeks I'll just sit down and I'll write down everything that I'm doing for my business and I'll just cull like anything that's just like pointless too, yeah. because yeah. you start to just build up it's the same as when you're buying stuff you just start to buy things you don't need you, you just start to ha- add all these little things up that are just not doing anything for you and i, I hate all of that clutter i i'm very much in the minimalist camp um yeah. and i think like you said it it goes hand in hand with building wealth over the long term because if you're able to uh, live below your means, dramatically below your means, you just live with what you need, then yeah. as long as you're making any, pretty much any sort of income, you'll have money left over that you can allow, let compound over the long term and build yeah, yeah. your wealth over the long term. And I agree with you in terms of the wealth thing. I, I don't think that there's such thing as building wealth very quickly. I mean, it just... It, it, it really irritates something that really irritates me. This is one of my pet peeves: is people right. on the news who win the lottery and they're like, "Yeah, we're going on a holiday. We're going to buy a 150 yeah. foot yacht." Uh, yeah, <laughs> stupid, stupid. And then they all they they go broke. Yeah, and they're back. Like, yeah, and then they're back to where they were before. In Except fact, it's they're worse. worse off. Yeah. yeah, they're worse because they've committed themselves to so many expenses. Yeah, and now um, they're used to that lifestyle, but they don't have any money anymore. And that's yeah. not wealth. That's just having more money at some point in time yeah, wealth is exactly. being able to generate it protect it and grow it over the long yep. term yeah i think um net worth is not a measure of wealth i think a better measure of yeah. wealth is cash flow i agree yeah what do you keep not what yeah. do you make yeah exactly what do you yeah. keep um hey i wanted to chuck in some quick fire questions because these Let's are i think these are questions that were actually left um on the in the podcast comment section Okay. So we should probably get through these as well. Um, one that I had um, was, um, I'm new to investing and I was wondering which websites you use to find out all your information about uh, stocks in the stock market or even where should I begin? Because at the moment, I'm currently just using Comsec and I would like to gather some more information from other resources. Um, is it worth buying like a subscription to Morningstar or something like that? Um, I, I'll just chuck in my answer real quick here. Uh, hmm. I think that when, when you're new to investing, the money that you spend, I think should be on um, like things like books. So things that actually help you um, understand more about investing itself, the actual process and uh, things that, you know, hear different perspectives of the best investors in the world to try and get your uh, strategy down pat more. So that's where I would spend my money first up. Uh, I wouldn't bother with like subscriptions like Morningstar and that sort of stuff because if you don't have your strategy down, then you're just going to get a whole lot of numbers that you don't know what they mean. Um, so I'd go for definitely something like that. I mean, a lot of the information that you need to assess businesses uh, is for free. I mean, when you start paying yeah. money, really what you end up paying for is you end up paying for someone else's opinion in a lot yeah. of these cases. So the subscription to Morningstar, what you end up getting is you end up getting things like analysts' uh, breakdowns of the stock. But at, at the end of the day, you should be basing your investments off of what you think, not what what else, uh, what else anyone else thinks. Same with like Motley Fool. At the end of the day, what you're paying for is more opinionated material on different stocks, what they think is a good stock. Um, so I actually wouldn't bother with mm. subscriptions. Like I don't have subscription to Morningstar or Motley Fool or any of those websites. Uh, I find that a lot of the the information, like the numbers that I need, can can be found on things like the Comsec uh, platform, their research platform, um, or Yahoo Finance, or MSM Money, or the Wall Street Journal, um, because I, and even just like the annual reports and that sort of stuff fr- from the actual company itself. Like you can get so much information out of reading the reports or listening to the conference calls. So, yeah, what do you reckon about this? Yeah, I agree. I think in terms of information that you need to analyze a business. 90, 95% of it is free out there. Uh, so I wouldn't, uh, like, I don't think you should be subscribing to hear someone else's opinion. I don't, I mean, I personally don't do that. I don't find that very particularly valuable. What I do, if I am going to be investing some of my money in terms of my portfolio, I would be looking to invest it to learn more about the strategy. So that means reading books about successful investors and seeing what they're doing or, yep. uh, but, but I mean, in, in terms of that as well, there's a lot of free information out there. I mean, on YouTube, yeah, there's sure. a ton of free information out there. 
Um, I think you can download a PDF of the Intelligent Investor for free. Oh, really? I, okay. Yeah, well, yeah, I think so. I think so. A lot of these books, you can just type in the name of the book PDF and you'll get it. Or you can like start an Audible free trial and just listen to listen to the Intelligent Investor or some of these other books as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I guess the process you want to go through is you want to start very simple and just start asking questions and then those questions will lead you to more complex questions. So, where you want to start is how do I find what what is the, what are the characteristics of a great business and yeah. how much should I pay for that? That's your two starting questions. And you just start from there. What is a great business? You find out that, oh, you can look at some of these numbers. What do some of these numbers mean? And just from there, you can just start asking questions and um, you can do most of it for free, I think. Um, yeah. So, I would just I start agree. there. Just start uh, with those two questions. What is a great business and how do I work out how much to pay for that great business? Yeah. No, I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, that t- did not turn out to be a quick fire no, <laughs> question. I'm so sorry. I said it was going to be a quick. <laughs> no, I, I started that. I said it was going to be quick fire, and then I like started this flipping huge monologue. Anyway, let me tell you um, a story. <laughs> all right, let's let's make these last two really yeah. quick. Um, what do you think of an upcoming uranium bull market, and what companies will you be investing in? Um, what do you think? Um, that's really. I I, I've got no idea. <laughs> Just very. I don't follow uranium at all. No, I, I don't follow uranium either. It's something that's outside my circle of competence, so I probably won't ever be investing in uranium companies. Um, but it, I mean, just quickly, it, it's pretty interesting uh, that uranium is this sort of thing that was sort of rejected as a an option of generating electricity, and now it's coming back because uh, we want more sustainable methods. And there's a lot of yeah. uranium out there. But what do you reckon, Brandon? Anything? Yeah, nothing? I, I think yeah, uranium. It's um, it's very powerful at um, generating electricity um, it's but it's just got obviously the danger attached to it so yeah. it's it's a very interesting uh, commodity definitely um, but I can't say that I know anything about it um, it, it lies far outside my circle of competence yep um, and then last one what are your thoughts on Phil Town predicting a stock market crash in the next 24 months um, what do you reckon well I mean okay Phil Town's been predicting a stock market crash in the next two years f- since I started investing, which That's is true. like three years ago. Um, he's been saying but to this, be fair, to yeah. be fair, the, the numbers that he looks at have been extremely high ever since that time as well. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. And I mean, he, he predicted, I, I think he, d- he did quite a good job of predicting the last one. I think this time he might be a little bit early, um, but he's probably not going to be wrong because uh, valuations, if you just look at valuations of stocks, they're higher than they have been historically. So that tells us that there's li- they're likely going to become better in the future. Yep. at some point. And they're quite substantially higher than what history tells us. Yep. Yeah. Um, so we got like, for instance, in, in the US, like I think the US is where it looks really quite scary. Um, the Schiller PE, which is that classic uh, number that kind of helps us understand where the market's at versus its historical earnings. Um, it's usually at about 16 and at the moment it's 30, over 30. Usually when it hits over 13, uh, sorry, over 13, over 30, (laughs) um, the market can't sustain that level for more than 12 months. I think it's sustained itself for quite a bit longer than 12 months now at that level, which uh, Mm. some people say, oh yeah, this is new normals. But to me, I just think that's like extra scary. Um, I don't think that a new normal, a new normal of the Schiller PE makes sense because it just means that over time, investors are more comfortable with paying like more stupid amounts for their stocks, which I don't think is... I don't think investors are that dumb, but you never know. Maybe they are. Um, and the other thing is that the Wilshire GDP, which is the big, um, uh, like almost like a total market versus GDP um, ratio in the US, uh, usually uh, the market can't sustain itself above 100%. And at the moment, it's at hundred and over 170%. And they're two big numbers that uh, Phil likes to look at as well. Um, so I think that's where a lot of what he talks about comes from which uh, I do agree with like um, the the big market tracking indicators uh, are all saying oh oh um, but nothing's well we kind of saw something around September October last year where it started plunging to, through to December but we haven't seen anything epically bad yet but yeah. um, it could be like what Ray Dalio is saying where um, he was he was predicting more of like a, a long a slow a slow long painful <laughs> decline yeah crippling like really slow fingernails on a chalkboard just yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah but I, don't I don't know, know. we'll just have to wait and see i mean 
I mean, it, it, does, it doesn't matter. Like, at the end of the day, we just focus on individual businesses and wait. We'll make sure we've assessed, you know, make sure we find good businesses with moats, um, good management teams, ones that we can understand. And then we just wait until they come onto a margin of safety price where we can uh, reduce our risk of loss when we make our investment. And uh, if we don't get those opportunities, then we keep looking around in our circle of confidence until we find something. Yeah, and I think that is probably a good a time as ever. We're just crossing over the one hour yep. mark. Yeah, so, let's get out of here. Yeah, see you later, guys. Bye. No, yeah, um, no. Thanks, for, thanks, guys. Bye. thanks for listening, everyone. I uh, hope you enjoyed this kind, of, this kind of episode. Yeah, if you, uh, if you want to see more episodes sort of just talking about a bunch of different topics, um, then make sure you let us know down in the comment section of the YouTube video, which will be on my channel this week, actually, uh, yep. on Hamish Hodder. Uh, and make sure you leave the... Uh, the um, the topics you would like us to discuss as well <laughs> yes of course yeah and give uh, us some ideas <laughs> yeah any questions any topics even if they're really massive topics we can unpack them so uh, yeah. anything at all uh, just let us know um, but yeah, yeah I guess we'll uh, we'll see you guys next week when yeah. we will be back for another yeah. episode with another episode sounds good catch you later guys see you later guys thanks for joining us <laughs>